Good morning. Grace and peace to you this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I am out of breath. I just ran up the stairs. Sorry. We were having our Bible trivia and potluck downstairs, and it ran a little late, and then I put down my microphone, and I couldn't find it, and I started running. So I'm here now, because it's time to worship the Lord in glory and splendor. We are in the middle of a sermon series on the seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins. Today we're talking about gluttony. Gluttony. So it's all the more perfect that we had a church potluck on the day we talk about gluttony. So pray for your pastor as his heart rate starts to slow down from running up the stairs. Uh, It's exciting to be in the midst of this series as we're coming closer to the season's conclusion, the end of Lent, as we embark on the season of Easter and Easter tide. Uh, On Friday night, we had a lock in here at the church. We had a gaggle of ten, uh, teenagers who were here all night long. They came at uh, 7 p.m. and they stayed until 8 in the morning. I came over around 9, 30, 10 o'clock uh, to get to hang out for a little while and to join together in worship. By the time I got here, it smelled exactly like you might imagine that it would smell in the church with a group of teenagers spending the night and they had all consumed so much sugar that they were frenetic and they were bouncing around. So we turned the, the lights off here in the sanctuary We had them come take a pew, and they were sort of loud and boisterous, and uh, we started singing music, and Eric preached, and we lit candles, and then I I offered them communion, and the longer we were in worship, the quieter they became, the more contemplative they were, till when we were at the end and we were singing, it was like they were very, very attentive. And so when I offered the benediction at the conclusion of the service, I learned why they were so attentive and quiet. It's because a few of them had fallen asleep in the pews. So the gospel is supposed to be a comfort to those in need. On Friday, it was a little too comforting, just a little bit. Uh, But I have a few more announcements to share with you. Thanks to those who were able to help paint the apartments yesterday that are used by family promise uh, families as they leave shelters that are provided by families, uh, church families like ours, and they move into residential living. Today's altar flowers are given by the Glisson family in honor of Hannah on what today would have been her birthday. Many thanks to the Glissons, and especially so good to see Ken. We've been praying for Ken a whole lot recently as he's recovered from surgery, and it's a delight to have you sitting in your pew in church. Uh, Holy Week is coming. I cannot believe that next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's crazy how quickly this season has come upon us. We have so many things going on during Holy Week from Palm Sunday next Sunday to our Monday Thursday service. Uh, We're going to have a crosswalk with other area churches at 3 p.m. a week from this Friday. We have a cantata that will be happening here on Good Friday at 7 p.m. with orchestral accompaniment. It should be rather amazing. Please plan to join us for that. Uh, And then on Holy Saturday, we will have the Easter egg hunt at the Dickinson's Farm that starts at 10 a.m. We still need more candy. We like to use as much candy as possible. We refill the eggs multiple times so the kids can have as much fun hunting for the eggs as possible. And then on Easter Sunday, we will have our 6.30 a.m. Easter sunrise service just a few blocks away at Everglades. Those. It is quite a sight to behold these people from the community coming together to worship as the sun rises in the cemetery. And then we will have our 9 a.m. service and 11 a.m. service on Easter here in the sanctuary as well. Today at 5 p.m., we're having the first gathering of what we're calling Wonderfully Made. This is a group uh, that is designed as a safe place and a safe space for people to come together and to talk about what it means to be in the world today, particularly around the subjects, uh, subject of LGBTQIA plus persons. Uh, If this is something that affects you or you're aware of or you'd like to learn more or be in conversation, you can join tonight at 5 p.m. in our parlor, which is just below us at the end of the hallway. Again, thanks to those adults who volunteered their time to be here for the lock-in on Friday night. It was really, really quite amazing to see all these teenagers here at the church. And please continue to pray for Eric Anderson, who, (laughs) who, who only barely slept on Friday night. Uh, This coming Saturday, so a week from yesterday, this coming Saturday, we're going to be having Skip Carter's Service of Death and Resurrection. Many of you know uh, that Skip and Nancy were longtime members here at the church. They moved at the beginning of January. We prayed for them here in church on their final Sunday, sort of sending them on their way to relocate in North Carolina. And before they had been in North Carolina for a week, Skip very unexpectedly and tragically died. Uh, And so Nancy and family will be coming back here to Roanoke this week 
so we can have skip service on Saturday. If you're able to join at 11, I know that it would mean the world to Nancy and to the family. And if you're not, please pray for us as we try to surround her with as much love as we can in this time of her grief. And then again, continued thanks for your prayers in support of Jennifer Moore, the missionary to North Macedonia who was with us a few weeks ago. Uh, We've been planning and talking with her for a long time, and we have a group of six individuals that we are sending to North Macedonia this summer. Six people from our church who have sort of responded to the movement of the Spirit in their life to go and to sort of represent us as we embark on this partnership together with Jennifer and her work. So again, during this month, the love offering will go to help offset the cost for our, for our team to get there this summer to do the good work that they're going to be doing. If you have any questions about what that work is like or you want to know more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Audrey Sisler, who is our, our missions leader here at the church. So with that, I'd like to share with you a story. A story. There was a church that was looking for a new pastor. Their last pastor had retired, and they needed to get a new one. Now, if they were Methodist, that'd be no problem, because when you lose a pastor, they, the bishop just gives you another one. But in some churches, that's not the case. Uh, we have an appointive system. A lot of churches have what's called a call system, where it's like a normal job. When there's an opening... They reach out to the community, to the world at large, and say, we need a new pastor, and they receive resumes. And so there was this church, they needed a new pastor, and so they put it out there, and they received gobs of all these people who wanted to apply. And they decided, they went through the resumes, they had a committee at the church who was going to go through them, and they were going to pick their top six candidates. And six weeks in a row, they were going to have those candidates come join them in church, meet folks, preach from the pulpit, lead in worship, so that after a month and a half, The committee could get together and then decide who of these six was the best of the best, who they wanted to have as the next pastor of the church. And so after the six weeks of the the visiting clergy coming, the committee got together and they said, okay, we have to decide who's going to be the next next person. They said, well, what do you think about the first person who came? They talked for a little while and then one of the women on the committee said, look, I know that this isn't what we normally talk about. I know I'm probably not supposed to say this, but I just got to tell you, I think he was too fat. I just think he was too fat. I mean, what does that say to the congregation if we just let a fat pastor preach every week? I mean, think, we've got to provide his health care. I, I don't think we want to get in the business of having a fat pastor. I, I don't know. And they say, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Let's go to the next one. Oh, she was wonderful. She was so kind and thoughtful, and she was just so attentive and present with people afterwards. She was amazing. And someone said, yeah, but she has seven children. I mean, that's just too many kids. How, how can she lead our flock if she can barely keep track of her own flock at home? She's got too many kids. Look, I know the first guy, yeah, he was too fat, but she, she's got too many kids. All right, well, what about the third candidate? Oh, what life and vitality? I mean, young people came, but he was so young. And someone said, yeah, so young that he was too young. He's young enough to be my grandson. I can't have my grandson be my pastor. All right, what about the fourth person? Oh, Have you ever heard such wisdom from the pulpit? I mean, just the reverence that he brought to this place of worship. Yeah, you know why he had all that wisdom? Because he was too old. We don't need someone like that. He's only going to be here five years and then we're going to have to bury him. No, the guy was too young and that guy's too old. Come on. Okay, number five. She might have been the best. I mean, I, I... I wanted to get up and, and shout and put my hands up. You know, I, it was amazing. I've never, I've never experienced church like that before. Someone said, yeah, I agree. But then I looked and I saw her wrist. What do you mean her wrist? Did you see she had a Rolex? She's too wealthy to be our pastor. You know what Jesus says? The love of money is the root of all evil. I don't think that's going to work. All right, what about the last one? Oh, my goodness. He used words from the pulpit I've never even heard. I mean, he was, he was talking about theology. I just wanted to bask. I could, yeah, you know why? Because he's a reverend doctor. We cannot call him reverend doctor Sunday after Sunday. That guy is just too smart. Too fat, too many kids, too young, too old, too rich, too smart. You know what this means? We got to get some new candidates. Let's put out another job search. Let's get six more people in here. And so they did. And then did it again. And they did again. And all the while, while they were looking for a pastor, less and less people came to church until the only people left were the people on the committee who could not find the perfect person to be their pastor. In all of their deliberations, there was nothing but judgment 
and judgment and judgment, which is good. Because the Lord says, judge not lest ye be judged. Why do you care so much about the speck in your neighbor's eye and you cannot see the log in your own? That's a word of judgment against judgment. How do we behold one another? How do we behold the world? How can we see each other the way God sees us? Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks that no matter what we have too much of, you've made space for us here. Take us as we are, full and empty, proud and shy, and form us in your Son's likeness that we might see one another the way you see us. And in so doing, we might be known less by our judgment and more by our love. And all God's people say, Amen. Taylor reminded me of a lady I used to cut grass for. She was an Oriental lady, and she called me Hute. Well, I, it took a few years, and somebody told me that meant fat man. <laughs> so good morning. I am Hute, uh, John Shockley, and I am glad to be your liturgist this morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Our simple, like flowers before thee, according to the Son of love. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, dark, drive the dark of doubt away.
Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumphs all of life. Please join together in singing the processional hymn, The King of, my, of Love, My Shepherd Is, number 138 in the United Methodist Hymnal. We will sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. The words will also be on the screen. share signs of Christ's love and peace with those who have gathered for worship and children I'd like to invite you forward Mr. Eric has something to share with you Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you all are here this morning. I am tired. <laughs> I was already tired, and then we had all of that wonderful food, and now I feel like I just could go to sleep. So I'm, I'm glad you all are here this morning, and this is going to be an interesting children's time. See, I didn't plan what, I, what really worked out 
uh, is going to turn out to work out pretty well for today's scripture. So that's just a little hint. I'll go ahead and, and get started. So today's scripture is about hard things. You know, following Jesus, Jesus tells us to do hard things. Like, he tells us not to worry about, about what we're going to eat or, or not to worry about how we look or not to worry about what we wear. But guess what? This morning when I came to church, I was worried about what I was wearing because I'm so tired, I forgot it was St. Patrick's Day. And so when I walked in the building and saw everybody wearing green, I looked down and I, I I'm not wearing any green today. So I quickly ran to my office, and I found a little bit of green tissue paper, and I stuck it in my pocket, and now I'm good to go. I got a nice little green pocket square right there. So I'm good, but I was worried about what I was going to wear. Now, that's kind of silly, but, but Jesus is telling us today in the Scripture not to worry about what we eat or what we wear or how we look. And he, and he tells us instead, he gives us examples, the birds. Now, this time of year, has anybody seen a bird lately? Has anybody seen a bird flying around their yard or in a tree? What kind of bird did you see? Do you know? Did anybody see? What, do you know what kind of bird you saw? What did you see? A crow, okay. Anybody, what did you see, Quincy? A cardinal. I love to see cardinals. Gordon, what did you see? What kind of bird? A robin. We see robins. What kind of bird did you see? A woodpecker. A woodpecker. Oh, awesome. Yeah. What about you, Corbin? A cardinal. We see lots of cardinals. We see lots of birds right now. And when you see, and butterflies, yeah. It's, when you see a bird, do you just see it or do you hear it sometimes? You hear it. And what are they, what are they doing? Do they, do they, tweet, tweet. Do, chirping. They're tweet, tweet. They're talking. They were taking a bath. Okay. Do the birds, do do the birds sound worried when you hear them? They, they sound worried or do they sound happy? Are they like chirping away and tweeting away happily? Does it sound happy? It, they sound happy. But guess what? They don't know where their next meal is going to be. They just fly around and, and look for food. But they're happy. They're singing happy. And Jesus then gives us another example. It's perfect for this time of year. He says, look at the flowers in the fields. Do, have you, are there flowers growing at your house or on your way to school or work? Not work. You guys don't work. But <laughs> as you are going around, do you, see, do you see flowers blooming? You don't see any flowers blooming? Well, look around because flowers are blooming all over the place right now. And God tells us to worry about the, uh, to look at the birds and to look at the flowers, to not worry about things. Um, so God tells us, instead of worrying, care about the things that I care about. Because I care about the birds, I care about the flowers, but more than those, I care about each one of you. I care about Corbin and Amara and Quincy and everybody up here. God cares about you. Will you all bow your heads and pray with me, please? Repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, you tell us to do hard things, like not to worry. But you also tell us that you're always with us. Help us to remember that. Amen. All right. You guys can go back.
This morning for our prayer time, I will be sharing a prayer inspired by the work of Katie Bowler. Now let us pray, please. Lord, oh, the power of a word, letters, syllables, squeezing us into small, terrible spaces with someone's judgment. Others have summed us up, tied us in bundles, and moved on. And in that temporary confinement, we strain and call out, wait a minute, but our voices don't sound right. We struggle to move on, but the criticism still holds. We are trapped, Lord, hearing the words that aren't teaching us anything but embarrassment and anger and more than a little self-hatred. Every criticism feels like a knife with a blade at both ends. Every time we try to yank it out, we open, we open fresh wounds. And yet, Lord, your verdict in our lives is love. If there is something terrible, awful we need to change, you nudge and prompt, but do, but do not in the voices of our critics. You, you speak to us as your friends, your children. You tell us what it is to have, have what it is and have ever been true. It is gentle and complete, yet breaks every chain. Quiet our, our self-critical hearts. Leave what reminds there, for, there are for our good and free us from all that makes us forget the joy and freedom of having you as our only judge. And as you taught us, so now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you not of more, are you not of more value than they? And can any of you be, by worrying, add one single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do, do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus' hair is still wet from his baptism in the Jordan by his cousin John when he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, and he becomes rather hangry. Do you know this word? 
hangry, when you're angry and you're hungry together at the same time. It's a tradition in the life of the church to observe the season we call Lent. And this season mirrors Jesus' temptations out in the wilderness. The 40 days in the wilderness are like the 40 days of Lent between Ash Wednesday and Easter. We sort of mirror Jesus' journey with our own uh, wrestling at t- with temptation. So during this season, some of us will abstain from certain items or behaviors or practices. A few of you here at the church have mentioned that this year you gave up Facebook. Good for you. I've heard some of you are avoiding chocolate. My favorite thing I've ever heard, though, this year for the first time, someone in this church told me that they've given up unkind thoughts for Lent. I wonder how that one's going. (laughs) Nevertheless, as it is so often the case in church, we tend to take all these churchy things and we make them about us. We take the season of Lent and we make it all about us, when in fact Lent isn't really about us, it's about Jesus. He is baptized by his cousin John, and there's the voice from the heavens, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, and immediately he goes off into the wilderness. Forty days, forty nights, fasting, and only after Scripture says that Jesus is hungry, or hangry, only after his hunger does the devil show up. Okay, 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 Satan says, what do we got going on here? If you are who you say you are, do you have some ID, JC? Oh, no, no, you don't have an ID in the pocket? No pocket in your robes? That's okay. That's okay. I think I know who you are. But surely you've got to be hungry. I mean, you've been out here as long as Noah was on the ark. But I see some boulders over there. Why not turn those boulders into baguettes? Might come in handy later. If you have to ever feed 5,000 people, I don't know. And Jesus says to the devil... It is written that we cannot and shall not live by bread alone. And the devil says, oh, you're going to quote scripture back at me? That's fun. They go back and forth two more times until the devil leaves until another opportune moment strikes. I think it's interesting that it's when hunger appears that the devil enters the story. It's only when Jesus is hungry that Satan shows up. And yet, the link between food and sin, desire and failure, is actually as old as the Bible, therefore time itself. Hey, Adam, Eve, welcome to paradise. So glad to have you here. You can have whatever you want. Just not the fruit from that tree over there. Everything else is yours. And you know what? Bless their hearts. They do what the Lord tells them to do until a certain slithering serpent arrives on the scene. What then are we to make of gluttony? That's today's sin that we're confronting, gluttony. What do we do with gluttony? Certainly, we, none of us here would consider a slice of wonder bread in the wilderness gluttony, let alone one apple from one tree. That's not gluttony, but gluttony is on the list of the seven deadly sins, which, by the way, is rather complicated when we consider the accusations that were lobbed against Jesus. Some of his chief critics railed against him because John's disciples fasted Whereas Jesus is ate and drank. You know, Jesus never turns down an invitation to a dinner party in the Gospels. Not once. And according to the language of the King James Version, I love people who say, if it ain't KJV, it ain't the Bible. I love those people. In the KJV, it says that the community accused Jesus of being, and I quote, a gluttonous man and a wine biber. And that's not even mentioning the long list of parables that Jesus tells that are specifically about feasts and celebrations, the party for the prodigal being the one that's probably the most famous. And that's still not even addressing the fact that when it comes to the central aspect of our own doxology, that is the height of worship for us, it happens at a table when someone gives us bread and a cup. And yet, it was at that first table with bread and cup, after tasting the bread of heaven, after sipping on the cup of salvation, that Judas chooses to betray Jesus. Have you ever noticed that something as nonchalant as a meal with family or friends can be the nexus point for sin? Consider Thanksgiving. Sitting around the Thanksgiving table when that one relative shows up, you know the one who always wears his or her political persuasion on their person? And you're just dreading the whole time when they're going to open their mouth and say what you know they're thinking of saying. Have any of you ever experienced that before? Probably not. We're all good Christians here. But if you've ever felt angry at someone in that moment, we probably, you probably didn't act on it. I'd have to be bailing you out of jail if you did. 
But when it comes to sin, Jesus says it's the thought that counts. It's the thought that counts. And yet, even still, it's strange, I think, for us to consider gluttony a sin. I mean, we have worshipped together today. Some of us, we started downstairs with a potluck. And now we're in here listening to Jesus, who loves to talk about meals and parties, who featured banquets and feasts and so many stories, and who ultimately said to us, when you're eating and drinking, do that in remembrance of me. It was once the case that every single meal was an opportunity for glorification. That is, there was a time when every single meal had a religious aspect to it because it was an event that demanded gratitude. When the food at the table was collected from the land beside the home, land that ran the risk of too much rain or too little rain, it was enough to make people downright prayerful about what they had. Because if you took your food for granted, you were abusing the goodness of God. Today, it's entirely different. Entirely different. Some of us might have backyard gardens. Good. You might cultivate cucumbers, toil with your tomatoes, grow green beans. But the fact that we can get whatever we want, whenever we want it, without thinking about what it took for us to get what we want when we want it, means that our relationship with food has changed completely. And before we get too much into this, it's important to note that when it comes to gluttony, we almost always equate it with fatness. Almost always. But as is the case with churchy words, we don't often know what we mean when we say certain words. Properly understood, gluttony is just overindulgence, which can, of course, include food, but it also includes anything, and I mean anything. Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic thinker, he said that gluttony has six daughters, excessive and unseemly joy, loudishness, uncleanness, talkativeness, and uncomprehending dullness of the mind. We can be gluttonous with our words, speaking without thinking about what we're saying or really caring about what someone might say to us. We can be gluttonous with the way we speak. We can be gluttonous with our time, filling up our calendars with so many things to do that we don't even have time to think about the things that we were doing. We can also be gluttonous with our devices, checking our phones 96 times per day. That's the average, by the way. We can be gluttonous. And it's not just that we can be gluttonous, we are gluttonous. Most of us don't think twice before we fill up our gas tanks, purchasing whatever food we want, and not even saying anything about the clothes that we buy that comes from places we do not consider fashioned by hands we don't want to think about. And for those of us who live in the land of the free, where we consume most of the world's resources, gluttony reigns supreme. Did you know that if every person on the planet ate as much meat as we do in the United States, we would need three earths to produce enough corn to feed enough cows to feed everyone the same amount of meat we eat. We are gluttonous. Gluttony can be found anytime we encounter the word too. T-O-O. Too much of something, too little of something can be gluttonous. Those who eat too much food, but also those who think too much about their food those who care not at all about what they consume, and those who are so highly focused on dieting that they have become extreme with it. They've become gluttonous with their dieting. Another fun fact, we spend more on dieting as a country than we do on education. Just think about that. What does that say about what we prioritize? It can be gluttonous to consume too much and to consume too little. But when it comes to food, we have to have it. If we don't have food, we die. We must have it or we wallow away. So we could probably all agree that overindulgence is a bad thing, but we don't think of it as a sin, except we do. Because of the list of the seven deadly sins, I think that gluttony is actually the most condemned, the most feared, and the most shunned of the whole list. We just don't think of it in theological terms. They've done all these studies, and they've sort of demonstrated that among elementary age school children, they are more judgmental of classmates who they think are overweight than they are to the bullies that are in their classroom. Elementary school age kids are more judgmental against heavy kids than they are against bullies. Adults, it is harder for an overweight person to get hired for a job, to apply for a mortgage, or to receive fair treatment at just about any institution. 
which is all the more concerning when you discover that our weight is often not something within our control. There are people who eat and eat and eat and they stay exactly the same size and there are people who eat less and less and somehow they get bigger and bigger. All the while, whether we want to admit it or not, we tend to ascribe heaviness to laziness, to lack of self-control and all sorts of other labels that are judgmental. I mean, there's just something so frenetic about the ways that we encourage a culture of self-indulgence. BK have it your way while at the same time feeling guilty for having it our way for being self-indulgent you see that's what gluttony is it's not just overindulgence it's self-indulgence it's what happens when my wants and my needs become more important than anything else Gluttony is what happens when we try to fill a void that is deeper than any object can ever fill, whether it's food, bank accounts, degrees, friends, family. And usually we flock to those things because we're afraid. Because when we're afraid, we want to hold on to something, put something inside of us to make that fear go away, but it usually just leads to more gluttony. Now, I hope, maybe, if you've been really paying attention, you've noticed something about this sermon that I've been gluttonous with my words. I've been self-indulgent. I started with talk of Jesus, the temptations, but then I started talking about us, and I have not said a word about Jesus since. I was trying to be meta with the sermon today. How quickly we move to being so self-absorbed that we don't even notice how we're doing it. That's what gluttony is. It's when we become so self-absorbed, when we're so obsessed with too much or too little that we don't even realize what we're doing. And then Jesus has these words for us. Why are you so worried all the time? Why are you worried about what you're eating and what you're drinking, about what you're wearing and how you look? Have you looked at a bird recently? Have you ever seen a bird afraid of its own colors? Can any of you, I love that Jesus says this, can any of you, by worrying, add an hour to your life? Have you looked at a lily in a field recently? They don't toil, they don't spin, and let me tell you, they are prettier than anything you've got in your closet. You don't need to worry about these things. You know why? Because your worry is eating you alive. But your heavenly Father knows what you need and it delights God to give you the kingdom. You know, it's the task of the church to cultivate habits, virtues that look like Jesus. But every time we want to act like Jesus, we appear counterculture. When Jesus says, there is enough, the world is always saying, that's not true, that's not true. There's always more to be had. The proclamation of the gospel, though, is that we don't need to worry, that we can be like birds and lilies because God gives. But we are so afraid. Our desire to live lives without fear just makes us more afraid because we're told again and again there isn't enough. Which is maybe why for millennia the church has decided that people like me, people like Deborah, those who are involved in music, that it's our job to tell you a different truth. Whether it's the songs we're singing or the sermons you receive or the sacraments we share, they all say one thing, you are enough. You're enough. And we say things like that in the church because the world is always trying to convince us of the contrary, whether it's from our bosses, our spouses, our friends, our foes, if it's on advertisements, videos, movies, and shows. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too poor. You're too rich. You're too slow. You're too smart. You're too bossy. You're too shy on and on the world goes. And then Jesus says, actually, you're enough. You're enough. You're wonderfully made in God's image. You are beloved just as you are. After Jesus waxes lyrical about lilies in the fields, this is in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount. You know what the very next thing Jesus says is? Judge not lest ye be judged. Why? 
Why do you care so much about the speck in someone else's eye and you don't see the log in your own? It's Jesus' way of saying, the more you judge, the more gluttonous you will become. But thankfully, Jesus comes to set us free from the tyranny of gluttony. Because Jesus has a different word for us. You are enough. You are enough. You are enough. I offer this to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God now and forever. Amen. We are gathered in God's house. God has proclaimed his word. And now we have a chance to respond to God with the giving of our tithes and offerings. During the month of March, we invite you to be part of our love offering, which will be used to support the mission work in North Macedonia that you heard about uh, last Sunday. Our offering enables us to participate in God's mission to transform the world. The information to give online or by text is on the screen. Offerings can also be mailed or brought into the church office. Thank you very much. as we are. 
meet us where we are, not where we ought to be. That we might see we have worth and value. That we are beloved as you have made us. And in that recognition, O Lord, we might be able to do this strange and wondrous thing. Give of ourselves, our tithes, our offerings, knowing that you can take them and bless them and use them better than we ever could on our own. So receive our gifts, O Lord. Bless them that the world might look more like your Son. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. As we stand, let us join together and affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's now join together in singing our final hymn. It's from The Faith We Sing, the smaller of our two hymnals, number 2166, Christ Beside Me. This, these words come from St. Patrick's Breastplate, so let us stand and sing together. Hear now this blessing and benediction. May the God of grace and glory, God of the beginning and the end, the God of life and of death and of resurrection, help you to see, know, and believe that no matter what the world tries to tell you, you are enough. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.